Last month, the Ark Encounter attraction by Answers in Genesis in Northern Kentucky announced they would build a version of the Tower of Babel. It won't, of course, be the real one, lest God confuse our human languages even more, but an exhibit. We are joined by Tim Chafee, who is not only an expert in biblical apologetics and an author of fiction about the flood, but one of the architects who helped build the backstory of Ark Encounter. This is Fantastical Truth, the podcast from lorehaven.com in which we explore the best Christian-made fantasy, science fiction, and beyond, and apply the meanings of these stories to the real world that our author, Jesus Christ, calls us to serve. And I'm E. Stephen Burnett, the publisher of Lorehaven, as well as the co-author of a non-fiction book about fiction called The Pop Culture Parent. And I'm Zachary Russell, and fun fact about me, I get seasick really easily, so if I had lived on the Ark, that would not have been fun for me and everyone else. And this is episode 74, What If Christians Created Backstory for Noah's Ark and Also Built the Actual Boat? And we'll be joined by Tim Chafee. Zach, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I have been a happy Answers in Genesis fan since... I attended uh, one of Ken Ham's earliest uh, addresses for an Answers in Genesis seminar. I think it was at a church in downtown Lexington, Kentucky in the early 90s, 94, 1994, I think it was. And at that point, there was no Creation Museum. There was no Ark Encounter. There may have been the hints of images of these amazing future attractions that they might build someday, Lord willing. And now we live in the future. The cars don't fly. There are no moon cities, but there is an actual (laughs) replica of Noah's Ark in northern Kentucky, where uh, pretty close to where I used to live, by the way. Now I'm in Texas, so it takes a bit more of a journey to get there. But I have been to the Ark Encounter. Uh, Just takes a little bit more traveling to get there. I can say firsthand that it is amazing. And I'm really looking forward to these expansions that they're doing with uh, with not only the Tower of Babel, but uh, in the future, uh, first century village and some other uh, Old Testament based attractions that really help to immerse you in your imagination and uh, not just your uh, truth recognition of the the fact that God's word is true and that uh, we are all living in the story shaped around our hero Jesus Christ. Well, we are already planning ahead to a road trip next summer, Stephen, and you know, the Ark Encounter might be along the way. It'd be a bit of a detour, but I, I think it's something I really want to take my kids to because we have the best conversations about this kind of stuff. Um, we were talking about it last night and uh, my middle daughter asked, well, how would they keep all the bees from stinging each other? <laughs> like, how would they stay safe from like wasps and that kind of thing? Because we, we have some of those in our backyard. And so our kids are always nervous about that. And, and then we started thinking, well, how, and how did all the animals, you know, stop from eating each other? Like, how in the world did they manage all this stuff for just months and months on end? And uh, Naomi was thinking back to a Bible study she was in uh, years ago where they got to the part where uh, Noah sacrifices uh, some of the animals and there's a pleasing aroma to the Lord through it. And this woman in Naomi's Bible study said, man, those poor animals, they thought they made it (laughs) just just to get sacrificed. Like, it's just it's a really amazing thing. But, you know, you think about even that question, like, well, how did the animals not eat each other? Well, it looks like people didn't eat animals before that, you know, because in, in what is it? Chapter nine, verse three, God says, you know, I, I give you every animal, uh, every land animal for food. And uh, so maybe people didn't eat meat before that, you know, and, and how in the world did animals get to the ark in the first place? And, you know, there, there are some really fantastical elements to this story. And what I love about the ark encounter is they are really trying to capture that, that wonder you know, cause you read this, you're like, really a flood covered the entire world. Like, you mean like we see in movies, you know, that have, have tried to do similar things and it's like, yeah, yeah. God was definitely involved. I mean, this is a real story. There were real people building a real boat, but there are certainly some supernatural parts of this story that we're also going to be unashamed about because the Bible is a fantastical, true story. Exactly. And of course you cannot have a creation museum or a theme park like Ark Encounter Without a concession stand, uh, we'll jump over to our Fantastical Truth a concession stand in just a moment. Our sponsor for this episode, once again, is James R. Hannibal's book, The Paris Betrayal. It's a military uh, spy suspense type story from Revel Books. 
James has been on Fantastical Truth before, talking about uh, his game Dragon Raid, soon to become Light Raiders. But before you go into the fantasy world, uh, explore the real world, uh, the world of spies and intrigue and intelligence operations from his pen. Here's the book description. After an intelligence operation in Rome goes sideways, Ben Calix returns to Paris to find his perfectly ordered world turned upside down. A hitman ambushes him at his flat. French SWAT tries to hem him in. This is a severance. The director has kicked him out into the cold, but why? To find answers, Ben must seek the sniper who tried to kill him, the spy master who trained him, the doctor who once saved his life, and the teammate who killed the woman he loved. And in the midst of this search, scouring Europe for his contacts, he must still try to stop a world-altering attack. That's the story. Here's an endorsement from the best-selling author of Hunt Them Down, Simon Gervais, who says, Hannibal once again displays his dazzling prose and ability to keep even the more experienced readers guessing. Another gripping, high-octane book from one of the best thriller writers in the business. That's the endorsement. You can see the book cover and get all the links in our show notes. And you, like me, may also want to play in your head, because we can't play it now because of rights issues, uh, that uh, end credits song by Moby uh, from the, uh, any of the, uh, the Bourne Identity films. I think it's just perfect background listening for a book like this. Next, let's go to our concession stand. I already got one unscheduled snack here. Uh, it was a surprise delivery. I didn't even include it in the original show notes. Zach, I think you can agree with me on this one. Uh, this is going to be a Nephilim free zone. Uh, no <laughs> Nephilim or Nephila, whatever the singular Nephilim. is. Nephilim. Nephilim. Yeah. No, no yeah. Nephilim allowed here. Uh, that is another <laughs> episode. I, th I think we actually already went there. We may have went there with Brian Gadawa in the, the early days bit. of the podcast. Yeah, just a little bit. It's a fascinating twist to the flood narrative, and a lot of uh, Christians, including fantastical storytellers, have done a lot of speculating about who were the Nephilim and why were they aliens, you know, that kind of thing. We've been there, done that with the aliens. We're not going to get into that right now. Personally, I get a little tired of the Nephilim distraction. Uh, I think that it distracts from some of the very human evils that were the reason why God sent the flood. Any involvement from extra powerful warriors or, uh, you know, uh, antecedents of the giants or whomever they're a mention in Genesis 6. Uh, the emphasis there is that God sent a flood to punish humans for their evil. Uh, Satan or devils are not mentioned there, although we can be certain they are a factor. Uh, it's humans who are at fault, and they deserve God's judgment for the flood. Uh, secondly, yes, this episode will touch on creation evolution, but mostly we're going to focus on the flood. Uh, that creation apologetics uh, full-on episode is to be done in the future. Third, uh, we will assume a global flood here. Speaking personally, from my vantage, uh, this is just plain how you Bible. Uh, you are meant to read through Genesis uh, 6 through 9. Uh, you're meant to get the idea that the flood is global. Sin is a global problem. Uh, God destroyed the whole world with the flood. Uh, any of the, uh, the special pleadings I've seen about how, well, maybe it was just regional, uh, don't account for the fact that God brought all the animals to the ark. You could have just evacuated them elsewhere along with the people. The flood covered the mountaintops. You can't do that with the local flood. We don't get into that in our conversation, but you can get into that with any of the links we include in the show notes. Fourth, uh, if you disbelieve that the flood was global, cool, that's fine. Good for you. You can still be a Christian. Uh, we're not going to throw you out. Uh, anything, uh, any feeling you get by you know, like uh, feeling like you're a lesser class of Christian or something, uh, that does not come from us. I think Christians can explore these issues in good faith. Fifth, though, uh, you may get bad vibes from even hearing the name Answers in Genesis or picturing the idea of the Ark Encounter. I would call that a bad vibe. Like maybe you got some issues with the church back home or some genuine emotional association there. I don't think, however, that's the same as a rational objection to creationism or creation science or apologetics. Let's maybe try to put aside the feelings or talk about them openly uh, rather than exchange the feelings for the apologetics discussion. Well, and Stephen, I, you know, I, I think what a lot of people get caught up in is, is this a tier one issue? You know, is this a core central Christian truth? Is this a gospel issue? Is, you know, I, I say it's a long. tier 1.5. I, I would okay. put tier 1.5, 1.6. Uh, it's not a salvific issue, but I mean, I do believe the answers in Genesis points that if you are to be consistent, uh, a reader of God's word, then reading Genesis 1 or reading in Genesis 1 through 11 be mindful of the genre. Be mindful of what the capital A author intends to communicate here. I would start from Scripture and only then try to bring in what the scientists are saying. Uh, faithfulness to God's Word matters to us. It ought to matter when we read the Scripture. And then we take any of the common grace, any of the wisdom from scientists or their theories, 
uh, into account, but subject those to God's word. Let's keep a fair mind on these issues. Uh, like I said, uh, healthy Christians can explore these in good faith. Mm-hmm. We will, however, just for the purpose of this discussion, because we focus on the imagination of the Ark Encounter and of any fiction about the flood, uh, we will just assume literal creation event and a literal global flood event and basing our imaginations on these. Finally, and risking a little bit of mild snark, if you get to the end of this episode and you still disagree, I would just end with the challenge. Build your own ark. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow the creation, the creation scientists, those crazy creationists, and I'm one of them, uh, they managed to build not only the Creation Museum, a top-tier tourist attraction about apologetics and immersing you in the world of the gospel narrative, but then they also went and then down the highway a bit, they built a fully functioning, freestanding, giant wood structure, Noah's Ark, and then they're building more around that and doing a good job with it. I don't think even the uh, the like the theistic evolutionists or Christians with different ideas of origins, I haven't seen them build an ark. And even if they did, I think they'd have to build a tiny one that would survive only a local flood uh, with a giraffe <laughs> sticking its head out the ceiling. Boo. And you know, this episode is not really an apologetic for Christian theme parks. Oh, I assume we ought to have Christian theme yeah, parks. Right. That, that, is a, that is a first principle for me. Uh, absolutely. We're, we're assuming it's a good thing because, um, you know, but that, that is some of the discussion I even see about this. Well, should there you know, even be, you know, Christian exhibits where you can go in person, um, to which I would just say, you know, look, uh, what is a theme park, but a story. And and we've already covered this in episode 50, like should Christians have fiction, you know, should, is fiction something that God wants us to have or not? I, I think is really the more fundamental question. So yeah, we're going to assume, yes, we should, we, we should use physical things to, to talk about deeper spiritual realities. Like there's nothing wrong at all with that. So we are we are going to just uh, kind of celebrate this this arc encounter. Uh, you know, you've been there, Stephen. So I'm going to uh, rely more on your experience there. But uh, it is definitely something I want to visit in my lifetime. And if you have a chance to stop by uh, lorehaven.com slash podcast for episode 74, I intend to put at least some of the photos from my arc encounter visit into those show notes. So you'll be able to see as well as hear about the arc encounter. And uh, Tim Chafee's arriving in just a moment to help uh, give us a behind-the-scenes look at the biblically-shaped imagination behind this attraction. Tim Chafee has just disembarked the boat. He is the content manager for the attractions division of Answers in Genesis. An apologist with a passion for training young people, he speaks regularly at the Creation Museum, camps, schools, and churches, And he has authored numerous nonfiction and fiction books, including the Remnant Trilogy and the Truth Chronicles. Tim also wrote an article for one of the first issues of Lorehaven about ARC legends, about flood legends around the world. Tim, great to have you on Fantastical Truth. It's great to be with you. Thanks, Stephen. Welcome, Tim. Tim, how did you discover biblical faith and fantastic imagination, including but not limited to your defense of six-day creation and a global flood? Oh, good question. So how did I discover biblical faith? I've always been a believer. Uh, I was raised in a Christian home. And um, from the very first things I can remember, I remember believing the gospel. I I don't, uh, you know, people say, Tim, when were you saved? I don't know. Because I don't know when I was lost. Sometimes that doesn't sound as as great of a testimony as the person who's (laughs) had a horrible life and was doing all sorts of sinful things. And then suddenly, you know, God saved them. But uh, I'm thankful for it. I'm grateful for the godly upbringing that I had. And I thank my parents for that. Yeah, so as far as fantastic imagination goes, I, I think my introduction to that probably was, uh, like a lot of Christians close to my age, it was Frank Peretti. Uh, I remember my sister picking it up at the Christian bookstore, my older sister, and then she had to go into the, the store for a while, and I was just sitting in the car, and I grabbed This Present Darkness and started reading. Maybe got through the first two chapters, and I was hooked, and then she came back and course she was going to read it first and i i couldn't get my hands on it until she was done but just the the concept of being able to teach biblical truth in uh, through fiction another big one for me uh, and i know sometimes people laugh at it uh, is left behind uh, i was working at a christian bookstore in the mid 90s uh, and left behind and tribulation force were number one and two and i had never never read them and i thought well they're the top selling books f- for for months and maybe even years now uh, what are these things? And and so I read the first one and I thought, does the Bible really even teach something like this? And so that is what really got me into studying scripture on, on a much deeper basis was the Left Behind books. And uh, 25 years later, I'm 
added several degrees to, to my name, uh, schooling, uh, written about two dozen books. And I speak to maybe, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people every single week at the Creation Museum at the Ark Encounter. And uh, I, I get to write the signage that people read when they go through those places. So there's like a million people a year at the Ark that, you know, they come across the things that I wrote. And I, you know, never would have dreamed that that's what God had in store for me. And uh, a lot of that can go back can be traced back to left behind in this present dark. That's awesome. That is fascinating. When when I was discovering answers in Genesis in the mid nineties, I was at the same time discovering the left behind series. So kind of got that same leveling up interest in scripture because of both of those, you know, one organization emphasizing human origins and the other, a a fictional book series based on a, a view of Christian prophecy, emphasizing the end times. Yeah. And that's really what it was for me too. It was, I, I started studying prophecy maybe for about two or three years. And then I heard this Australian guy talking about dinosaurs on the way home from playing basketball one night. And I always loved dinosaurs. I, I always liked the Australian accent. I thought, I got to listen to this. And of course, it turns out to be my boss, Ken Ham. And I ordered everything I could get my hands on and really started studying, you know, end times and then creation. And I knew God's word was true from the beginning to the end. Well, it's a good thing we're keeping this separate instead of trying to bring dinosaurs into the future, because that could have uh, some interesting implications. But only but, uh, only Jesus can do that when when he right. resurrects the dinosaurs. Uh, there's oh. there's no problem with the science there. The 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 master of creation <laughs> has entered the chat. Here's hoping with the new heaven, the new earth, we get to see T Rex. Yeah. Uh, actually, I remember it was a a, a book uh, by Ken Ham. It was Aegis for Adam, uh, where they had the page at the end uh, showing the restoration of creation. And the little dodo character uh, was yeah. winking to the audience saying, I wonder if there will be dodo birds on the new earth. <laughs> Seed planted. I mean, I later got you know, more uh, detailed studies of uh, the resurrection, the new heavens and new earth. There is every biblical reason to suppose that all of those extinct creatures will be restored. And that's just one of the little benefits I got, you know, studying both human origins and then uh, speculating about the end times. Uh, it's one of those little, little truths you get that uh, adds zest to life and a little bit of a little bit of glory to God there. Yeah, uh, yeah, I hope so. Uh, when Peter speaks of the restoration of all things, I, it seems like all things probably means that. Yeah. And uh, I take yeah. that literally. Well, we're going through Genesis right now with our kids, and we, we're reading, you know, just straight through Genesis, and then reading some articles that go along with it. And this study Bible I have makes the point that God loves the animals, and that that was just such a simple point. But I I thought that's so profound that the animals on the earth aren't an accident. There's something that God was really happy to make in it that he loves them the natural joy and wonder that my kids have just learning about animals like that is such a reflection of god's heart and it's it's easy to sort of like get lost in other ideas about animals but th- that is just so central to his heart that he loves all of the life that he created here yeah i agree and it, you can tell a lot about a person by the way that they treat their animal i mean the, the i think it's a proverb, proverb talks yeah. about that yeah mm-hmm. and um you know, God has called us to be stewards of what he's given us. And so we should be treating them well. I mean, I, I enjoy eating certain animals. I enjoy that a lot. And so I like Genesis 9, 3, but I certainly <laughs> we shouldn't be mistreating them uh, or abusing them, but um, using them for God-given purposes. Well, that goes back to the Noah narrative, does it not? Because uh, I think careful biblical theologians will note the purpose why God chose to preserve uh, every land dwelling creature on the ark and i'm not sure about insects and all that their eggs could survive out there uh, even among the flood waters a uh, fish may not have been an issue but clearly god wanted to preserve his creation even while judging his creation and that that ties to me uh, uh to me that ties in the beginning and the end you know god does not abandon his creation he will not abandon his creation uh, to the corruption of sin. He is going to judge his creation at first by water, global flood, I do believe, and then an equally global fire judgment to come. Uh, either way, the purpose is to wipe the earth of sin and bring about a restoration. Uh, the prototype being the flood uh, that Noah and his family and all the animals were able to survive. And then the final version being that judgment by fire. So it all goes together. And and for me, just writing about these issues and then trying to imagine about these issues uh, I think as a as a serious Christian, you cannot do that without studying the origins, the purpose for why God makes these things. 
uh, the reason he gave that call to Adam and Eve to steward the earth's resources. I believe in a literal garden, by the way, and then eventually going out and they would have made literal cities. They would have been making culture without the thorns and thistles. Sin's corruption ruins that. Um, I take that and I go with it in the direction of how do we understand human culture, including storytelling and imagination. It's originally God's idea. It was made for us to give him glory, but sin jumps in our sin, our rebellion, starting with Adam and Eve, uh, that poisons it at the root. Uh, it, it poisons our hearts. And so all throughout the rest of our lives, uh, we have to deal with that corruption, but then also look to Jesus uh, for redemption and then know that Jesus will come back and eventually make all things new. Tim, I got to ask you then about uh, how Answers in Genesis helps to create some culture on the way to that restoration, uh, not only through the apologetics that this organization has been doing since the 1990s, uh, Ken Ham and many others putting all that together, uh, trying to serve the church there, uh, but then doing attractions like the Creation Museum uh, and then the, the more recently opened uh, Ark Encounter. Uh, what is it like and how did you get to uh, to be able to make uh, the scripture inspired backstory for the nonfiction flood, you know, doing some imagination shaped by scripture and scriptural speculation uh, for all of the exhibits throughout Ark Encounter, uh, just as you were able to do for the text at the Creation Museum. Yeah, that was a it was a real challenge uh, because we have um, I, I think you guys probably encounter this from time to time. Um, there are certain Christians who do not like uh, speculation at all. And um, they tend to be on the more conservative side of things. And so there are people who will go through the ark and they get really upset about certain things. Like we, uh, we chose to name the women on the ark. And when we first opened, uh, hmm. I would get emails about once a week where people would kind of condemn us for adding to scripture. And uh, be because of the naming of the women, they never complained about the way that the characters looked, uh, how they sounded, uh, what they wore how the animals looked, what the ark looked like. All of those things are artistic license too. But the fact that we gave them names, they would get really upset about. Huh. And then, uh, so what we did is the very beginning, when you walk into the ark, there's a set of signs called artistic license. And, yes. um, and it gives five details, like the naming of Noah's wife and, and the other women, like the what the animals looked like, what the ark looks like, um, and what the people look like. And since then, I think, that's been up for about three years. I think I've gotten two complaints since then. So Good. those have been very effective that people realize going in now that, okay, I'm, some of this is um, artistic license. They, they had to do it in order to make a themed attraction. Uh, we want you to think of those people as real people. And so somebody would say, well, why don't you just name her Mrs. Ham or Mrs. Noah? Well, because <laughs> that wasn't their name. They, they had a real name. We don't know what it was. But when we were doing this, we... We wanted to have a consistent backstory for Noah and his family members uh, so that all all of the exhibits from all three decks would have one consistent story because we would have um, different designers working on different exhibits. And yet I was the content person. And so I put together about a 15 to 20 page backstory for Noah and uh, what the family members would be like, you know, personality traits, and um, gave that to the different designers. And then we kind of worked within that framework as we were doing it and uh people started encouraging me you know that, hey i really like this backstory you should turn that into a novel and i huh. i, I kind of liked the idea and then i also didn't like it i thought well someday i'm going to meet noah and i don't want him to get upset with me and, <laughs> what, were, what were you thinking you know i was way smarter than that or i never would have done that um and and there's still always that hesitation on my part because i don't want people to think i'm trying to add to scripture and i thought if there's a way i can help people be able to distinguish between what's scripture and what is fiction, then I'll do it. And and so I did that in a couple of ways in the novels, uh, the Remnant trilogy, uh, which is kind of like the official backstory for Noah and his family at the Ark Encounter. Um, one thing we did is we we included like twenty about thirty pages of nonfiction at the end of each book, dealing with questions people have about the flood, about the Ark, about the pre-flood world, uh, about Noah. And what I wanted to do is there's a lot of popular level ideas about Noah that don't come right from scripture. And so we would intentionally break those right away. 
And so a lot oh, of people give, have heard give me an example, one of those. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of times people have heard things like, Oh, it never rained before the flood. Oh. And and there's a couple of arguments that you can make for that. You know, Genesis and the, the 2, mist 5. went out from the garden and that yeah. was how the earth got irrigated, but there's never yeah. a universal negative. There's, there's very little space in those first few chapters of Genesis to say such a thing about the, uh, the pre-flood climatology. Exactly. And, and all it's really t- doing is saying it hadn't rained up until day six when God makes man. Now, can you extrapolate for the next 1600 plus years? Or, well, some people think you can. I, I don't think that you really should. But so one of the things we did is I think at the fourth chapter, as they're walking to town, the, a rainstorm the night before had wiped out part of the road and they had to redo it. And so right away, people would be thinking, wait, why did they have it rain? Because I thought it never rained before. And uh, so that's one of the questions in the back of the book that can help them dive into scripture a little more and pay closer attention to it. And so there were a lot of little things we did like that to try to break those stereotypes that aren't based right on scripture itself, but maybe are based on deductions people make that sometimes reasonable, sometimes not so reasonable. Yeah. Well, I I love that emphasis that you are using imagination to try to push people towards biblical fidelity, not away from it. And you're, yeah, I know exactly what you mean that a lot of people get kind of squirrely when you start imagining, you know, what else could have happened or trying to fill in the gaps and and people worry that this is going to take me away from a literal and true reading of the Bible because we've all seen artistic license gone wrong. Uh, The famous example I always use is when I was a college student, I was watching this uh, TV special called Jesus 2000. And uh, I was funny enough, I was actually watching it with a Muslim student. And we got to the scene where Jesus meets John the Baptist. And first of all, it's like they didn't even know each other, which yeah. I'm like, okay, that's not true. Is that the one where John says, if you repent of your sins? Yes. I remember that. That was, yeah, the, that was, that was the moment. Well, well, that's all kinds of heresy there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. yeah. He says, John, would you baptize me? And John says, if you repent, you of, repent your of your sins. Oh, and, G- and Jesus says, well, okay, I will. just lost the plot. Yeah. My goodness. And, and the funniest part was my Muslim friend that was watching with me, he just stood up and was like, wait a minute. Jesus never sinned. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you, you, you are double heresy there. Yeah. Heresy in two religions. That's right. incredible. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wow. So I was like, so the Quran tells you that? He's like, oh yeah. The Quran says Jesus was sinless. I'm like, well, boy, they're just making everyone mad with this uh, show here. So was that, was that Christian Bale playing Jesus in that one? Or uh, was he in the Mary know. one? Uh, Christian that, Bale a... played Moses in the, in the bad Moses movie. Uh, oh yeah. That's okay. But I think he played Jesus. It, it was either in that Jesus 2000 or in, there was a, a short, or a mini series about Mary at a uh, right around the same time, but he played Jesus. In Interesting. Yeah. So, you know, obviously they are, um, they're using artistic license in an unbiblical way, or at least that would lead you away from biblical truth. Uh, yeah. Noah and, would be another good example. Yeah. That, yeah, oh, yeah. So, so how, how did that, uh, how did you guys deal with that when that came out? <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Well, we're referring to the Darren Aronofsky film, 2014 yes, Noah. 2014. Uh, we, yep. we actually reviewed it at the, uh, at the speculative faith website that preceded Lorehaven, our, our, actually our review chief, before he was the review chief, Austin Gunderson, he reviewed it. He, he actually liked it. And Austin's a solid, you know, biblical guy and believes in creation and all that. Uh, his reason for liking it, at least on its own terms, was this is an else world. Uh, this never happened. It's not even based on the biblical version. Like this, this is a completely alternate universe, you know, where Superman is evil and Spock has a goatee. And then Ar- rock monsters defended the Ark uh, from the rampaging hordes of heathens. And then they had a stowaway who ate a snake and all kinds of other weirdness. So, yeah, Christians have definitely had some issues on that. And I'm sure y'all at Answers in Genesis had plenty to say about that as well. We did. Yeah, I remember it was going to be um, Ken. Ken Ham and I were going to do we we're going to go watch it the night before. And then we were going to do like a live webcast. Uh, well, that turned into like 17 of us who went there the night. That oh, they, wow. <laughs> it, it opened the night before. Oh, opening. to have joined um, that group. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember telling Ken right before we went on, right before the show started, I said, hey, Ken, tomorrow when we go on, we should we should both say something that we liked about the film because too many people view us as just like crotchety people. You know, you just want to complain and grumble about everything. And as soon as the film finished, he walked over to me and I said, uh, yeah, scratch that because there's not <laughs> enough, there's not enough there to like. There I, is, to me, it was a global flood. It the was flood a global, was global flood. There we go. The one thing I liked from a storytelling perspective, I liked how the animals were guided to the ark. Uh, like they planted the seed in this little river kind of stretched around the, the globe and it kind of guided the animals there i don't think that's what really happened but from a storytelling perspective that was kind of cool that was about it that mm-hmm. the my biggest problem is the the morality so god yes. 
and Noah are evil in the in the movie. Oh wow! The fallen angels are the good guys, and it's all about almost like eco terrorism to the extreme. It's all about Noah wants to wipe out. He wants the creator to wipe out everything, and then all the people should die too. And then it's then it's just the animals living on the earth, and that's it's not even close to the biblical narrative. We were the virus all along. Yeah, and that is I'm, basically the theme. I saw it actually. My wife and I saw it in theaters out of curiosity, if for no other reason. Uh, I appreciated the effects. I appreciated obviously some of the very minor themes in there. Uh, if you if you have God destroying the earth because oh no, they're eating the animals and they're destroying the environment, like well. That's like part of the story, but that's the call to stewardship gone awry, which is the fruit of a worse root, which is sin, which is rebellion against God, which leads to the abuse of stewardship. Uh, the, the main problem is not the abuse of stewardship. Uh, I think, yeah, that's what you would call a, a, a bad biblical fiction. It's not being shaped by what scripture tells us, reading the Bible on its author's own terms and according to the limits of the genre. Uh, that's raiding the Bible for spare parts to plug into your story, uh, which I think yeah. is an approach different from what y'all are doing at Ark Encounter, uh, as well as uh, I would say, like, you know, the makers of the Chosen TV series or some of the better uh, biblical uh, films, Bible based films that still have artistic license, uh, even when they contradict the scripture in minor ways. Yeah. And I think in the case of Noah, there was, I think it was intentionally inverting the morality. I don't think that was by accident. It's just a reminder that we need to be discerning. Uh, so, uh, maybe we can put it in the show notes if I se- remember to send it to you. But uh, I ended up writing about a 4,000 word review on that movie uh, overnight and then early into the morning. And <laughs> we had to get it up there right away. I think I remember so, reading that. Yeah. Yeah. Because so, that's yeah, how everybody was talking about it. Yep. And I had a friend f- who flew out to, I think it was, was a Paramount that made that. Um, he, he was flown out there and reviewed it. Uh, and he liked it too. Um, but he got to be in there with the filmmakers and they explained you know, why they did what they did. And then they watched it. And so I think he was just kind of geeked that he got to do that and told me that he thought it was really good. And then I watched it and I thought, yikes, I'm not sure how, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure how anybody can think it's really I think good. Creative, imaginative Christians ought to grow up enough where we realize we're living in a world where we can geek out about some things, but also risk coming across as crotchety. You can say, wow, that was a really well-made movie and I like this and this, and this here is an example of common grace. Uh, And then this here is an example of idolatry. You're hijacking the story. Uh, This is not what the original author would have wanted. Like the book was better. You can say that. That is a geek (laughs) thing to say. And I think that's an unsung secret of a lot of folks at Answers in Genesis up to and including Ken Ham is my impression has been there are a bunch of nerds working at Answers in Genesis. Like some of the some of the even the earlier um, uh, messages by Ken Ham in the mid 1990s, he's dropping film references right and left. He obviously saw Jurassic Park multiple times, uh, whereas in in the in the world that I was in, you know, we didn't care to see movies like Jurassic Park. You know, lots of people will associate Answers in Genesis with uh, some kind of a, a sheltered experience. Like to me, it was a way out of the sheltered experience. You know, this was engaging the culture, and they had planned all along to build a creation museum, which they did. Early materials talked about that. Someday we're going to build a creation museum. And then they said, and after that, you know, maybe someday, you know, far future, uh, we'll, we'll build an ark. Well, what do you know? There it is. Well, there it is. This is my little Jurassic Park uh, quote there. Uh, and and how would you describe then, like going inside the ark for those who haven't been there? Uh, my my family and I got to go there in I think summer of 2018, finally. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's this large uh, freestanding wood frame structure, gardens around it. I mean, it is a full functioning theme park. You've got buses. Uh, I mean, it almost feels like going up to the front gate of Epcot Center, except instead of a giant geodesic dome, you have this giant arc. Yeah, I, well, I think you you hit it well. The, the people are amazed at the size. And usually what I'll do is I'll ask people what they thought of it. And a lot of times, or what, what their favorite part was, and a lot of times they say, oh, the whole thing. I like, no, no, you can't just say the whole thing. <laughs> well, I just, I'm just blown away by how big it is. And usually they tell me the writing was the best part. Uh, no, they don't tell me that. I wish they would tell me that. <laughs> there are a couple of people who have, but for the most part, they don't say that. When you go inside the ark, you get to see the structure of the building. And if you're, if for no other reason, if you're somebody who loves construction and architecture, you're going to marvel at what, what they did. It, it, it's amazing. Yeah, the largest freestanding timber frame structure in the world. It's based on the three decks of the ark. The first 
deck is kind of themed in terms of uh, just getting people on board and getting you used to the concept of animal kinds and how could you fit the animals on the ark, uh, dealing with some questions that people have about the construction of the ark. And then on deck two, it's kind of like life during the flood and um, what, what was it like for the family to take care of the animals and how could they achieve the things that they obviously did. And you get to see a lot of the animals that we sculpted there. The, the third deck is uh, after you go through the living quarters, it's kind of the historical and scientific exhibits all the way up to the present day. So it's kind of walking you through history. Some of the exhibits are more utilize artistic license a lot more than others. For example, we've got a pre-flood world exhibit trying to show people in a family friendly way what that world would be like. And uh, that was very difficult to to walk that line between showing extreme wickedness, but doing it in a family friendly way, because we know we're going to have lots of families coming through. And, you know, one of the pictures that stands out to me is um, there's an illustration where it's showing this battle or, or this, the city had been conquered and it's burning in the background. And in the foreground, you've got this guy who's holding up his sword. Well, in the original sketch, he was holding up a severed head. Oh, wow. And mm-hmm. you've got all these guys who have just been conquered are kneeling down before him. And I said, guys, you can't do that. And all of the artists that I, you know, I work with incredible artists, the people who make all these things, they're, they're very, very talented. And they kept pushing back and saying, no, it's realistic. I was like, I know it's realistic. I know that kind of stuff happened, but you can't show that because it's a family friendly attraction and you don't have to show it in order to get the point across you you see the guy standing there with a sword and the guys are kneeling down burying their necks you know what every adult knows what's going to happen yeah you don't have to show it after about i don't know maybe 45 minutes of discussion back and forth i realized none of those guys have kids there you go there you go and so uh, so we were able to get that toned down a little bit and uh you know one of the dioramas we show child sacrifice but you don't um, you don't have to see the knife going into the child. You you can see the women bringing their child up to this altar and then leaving without the child. Yeah. And parents will know what's happening. And in the side of that structure, you have these rooms where there's women who are, you know, it's, it's depicting temple prostitution without showing it. You don't have to pull the curtain back so people know what it is. Adults will know what's going on there. Kids will just say, hey, there's people talking there. <laughs> and if the adults want to explain it, they can. You know, in that exhibit, there's certain things that some people think, oh, you went too far. Um, or other people say, no, you should have pushed it a lot further. And you just, you can't please everybody. Um, some people want us to put a warning on there that there's graphic descriptions of violence. And, you know, we've gone back and forth on that. At this point, we haven't done it. Um, if you read the Bible, there's some pretty graphic descriptions of yes. violence. You know, read the end of Judges. That's a disgusting yeah, it's pretty R-rated. Yeah, yeah Judges yeah, nineteen that's... may be the the low point uh, for grim, dark reality <laughs> in a land with no king and everyone yeah. did as they pleased. Yeah, exactly. You know, in effect, you're using imagination to answer a question that everyone comes there with. Like, you know, you, you said how people come there asking the question, "Well, how did they fit all these animals, or how did they take care of those animals?" But I I think really the bigger question everyone's asking is, "Why did God tell Noah to build an ark?" And really, the question is, "Why did He send a flood?" You know, we have these jokes like, oh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And we all kind of know what that means. And we all sort of laugh it away. But, you know, the world pre-flood, uh, from everything I understand, is probably a lot worse than anything in Vegas. And and there was just no guardrails to anything that was going on. The law had not been given yet. And so everyone just did whatever they wanted. And that's that's kind of a scary thing almost to even imagine because we are we are used to those guardrails. And yet you guys are, are walking that fine line to help people imagine that, to help people say, man, I'm really glad there was a flood, you know, because we, we, we read the story and we think, oh, it's so great that God saved all the animals. But then you're like, what about all those other people? You know, because we, uh, the other movie I keep thinking of is 2012, uh, oh, yeah. you know, where, where spoiler alert, there's a global flood and then yeah, they build it's all a bunch these of boats. innocent people who die in that case right. for right. entertainment. Yes. Yeah. And then, you know, they try to save all the, um, the laborers that are actually building the boat say like, wait, why are we leaving all these people behind? And so it's all about saving as many people as possible. Whereas the, the flood narrative is like the inverse of that. So you have to think, well, why did God want to do that? And that's, that's really the question everyone has. Why is there judgment? Why does there have to be punishment for sin? That's not something that we, you know, in our Western, uh, you know, just the, the overall agenda of, of tolerance and, 
whatnot, we, we think, well, that, that seems a little extreme, doesn't it? So uh, I, I think the way that you're helping people imagine sort of helps them come to their own answer for that. Yeah. And that was one of the tricks of that exhibit as well, because if we, if we toned it down too much, people wonder, well, why would God judge them? You know, if, if it doesn't look that bad, why would God send the flood? And so it has to look violent enough or wicked enough for people to understand, yeah, that these people deserve God's judgment, which of course, as Christians, we know we all deserve God's judgment because we've rebelled against him. But the average person going through who doesn't understand that concept, uh, they have to understand this is a very wicked society. I mean, when God tells Noah, you know, I've seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. Is he the only believing person? I, I, I don't think so necessarily, but he's the only one whose family is going to go on board the ark. And, um, you know, I had the, the day that we opened, July 7th, 2016, we had a, about, I don't know, 70, 80, 90 protesters at the ARC site. Mm. And um, I, I went down there. I had a friend who invited me there and uh, we were, and he said, hey, Tim, since you wrote the signs, maybe you can answer questions if they've got any. And so we engaged in conversation for about three hours. And then I actually got to give a tour to 21 of these atheist and agnostic protesters through the ARC on opening day, which was, wow. was awesome. I loved it. Uh, but while we were out at the, protest site one guy kept saying well why would god send a flood why would he wipe everything out and mm. he's the type of person that just wanted to attack he didn't want an answer mm -hmm. and i said well, i can think of a couple of reasons why a flood and he's like well why why wouldn't he just cause them to you know when they in their sleep he could just kill them there they don't even know they don't have to undergo the terror of drowning and you know of course trying to make god seem as bad as possible and from an emotional perspective i, I can see why that would be effective at persuading somebody but if you think about the flood, there's there's a few reasons why that makes more sense. Um, one, if you're awake during it, if you see these floodwaters coming, that gives you an opportunity to cry out to God. That is true. Wow. And you have this last chance, like, hey, I'm about to die. Um, let me call on my creator for forgiveness. And now we, they didn't know the gospel message in terms of, you know, the son of God is going to die on the cross and rise from the dead, but they could still cry out to their maker. And uh, who knows if, if anybody did during those last moments, I don't know. So that's one reason. Another reason, it leaves a record. When we look at the world around us today, and we see all of those layers in the Grand Canyon, uh, in, which we find all over the globe, actually, the same layer that you find in the Grand Canyon, you find in, in northern Wisconsin, that you find in Israel, that you find in Africa, meaning this was a worldwide event, and this layer was laid down at the same time. But it leaves a record. It's a reminder that God judges sin, and you see all these fossils, which are dead things, you know, in those rock layers, and it's a reminder that God judges sin. He did it before. He's going to do it again. Yeah. So trying to portray that in as real a way as possible and helping people understand this is real history. Because I think a lot of times when we think about biblical events, people have this mindset that it's, it's like Greek mythology. It's like uh, something, it's just, you know, it's just this religious belief. No, Noah was a real person walking on the earth and he went through a real flood. Jesus Christ was a real person who walked around first century Israel and then actually died on a cross and actually rose from the dead. I mean, those things really happened. You almost said billions of dead things buried in Rucklay is laid down by one. <laughs> uh, true AIG fans know it's a Ken Ham <laughs> catchphrase from the, uh, from the early days. I sympathize regarding the, you know, representing acts of violence and the consequences of sin. I mean, I, I sympathize with both sides there. I can understand the need to protect children from images and, you know, consequences of sin for which they're not yet ready. But as a, an adult going through the creation museum and then the Ark encounter, it is an act of like, I would say simulated repentance going through and not only reading signs or, you know, listening to a sermon uh, about human sin and how it corrupts the earth apart from God's judgment or redemption. But uh, you, you, you feel it. You're seeing these pictures, the dioramas and the illustrations, you know, with or without uh, the severed head. Um, the impact is there. I think that's almost what people will describe when they're talking about going into like, certain uh, liturgical traditions. And they're not just hearing the word of God, but they, you know, they feel that they get uh, an extra potent dose of that through the imagery. There's a lot of abuse that can be done with smells and bells, but I can at least imagine why people would feel that way. And then I, I translate that to even the feeling of a theme park with this creative representation of biblical reality, artistic license and all. 
I go through there. Last time I did, I go through there. It's like an act of worship. I, I'm not just thinking, wow, it's so big. But if someone were to ask me my favorite part, I wouldn't just say, wow, it's so big. I would say it was the immersiveness of the experience. Like you are, you're immersed in this world. Like many people who believe this did exist have put this together with biblical apologetics and artistic license to help you not just know that this happened, but help you feel that this happened. And in the meantime, like the excellence of the creativity, uh, I think brings glory to God. Uh, I think of the, uh, I think of the apostle Paul talking about uh, how the church in Corinth is supposed to behave. If someone comes in, like he says, like, well, in that specific context, he's talking about how to control the, the gift of tongues that was going on then. And he says, all things must be done decently and in order. Like he wants people to not just behave themselves, but to organize, you know, to do things with excellence so that if someone comes in, they can say, wow, God is truly among you. And I think there are many Christian artists who want that response from the world, but they feel like they have to break away from or ignore or partition certain biblical realities uh, in order to appeal to uh, non-Christian audiences. Uh, I see the reverse happening. I think that the more Christian you are, uh, the more willing you are to confront biblical reality, including the depravity of man, the more you will appeal to those whom the Holy Spirit is, is reaching out to, uh, is influencing. And that's what I get from Ark Encounter. And I guess that, um, that leads us to our third question here. Uh, what is next for Answers in Genesis and the Ark Encounter, and how can Christians respond to that? And we'll, we'll finish off with maybe a, a few apologetics bits here as well as we draw to a close. But I just wanted to say first, like I, my experience with Answers in Genesis, uh, in particular about some of these issues, I did not think about the the reality of the violence of the world before the flood until Answers in Genesis was talking about it or illustrating it. Uh, I actually think that in my case, I mean, other Christians may feel differently, but in my case, it was the sentimentality that I would have otherwise been exposed to. Uh, Answers in Genesis headed that off. And some people grow up and they say, well, you know, I, I got that vision of Noah's Ark, you know, with the draft sticking its head out the roof and, you know, it won't, won't stay like a Chinese junk. Uh, and then I, when I when I grew up, I put off childish things, including the, the you know this silly flood myth, and you know how could a good God and so and so. AIG confronted that head on. AIG confronted racism head on. My first, uh, I think, exposure to that topic and engaging that topic in particular from a biblical worldview. Uh, and so some of the headlines I saw after a recent announcement about this uh, Tower of Babel exhibit. We're saying, oh, uh, uh, Ark Encounter uh, Answers in Genesis, Ken Ham is going to. Uh, uh, he's going to tackle racism next. And I'm thinking, oh, ye silly little men. He has been talking about this since the mid-1990s, and so has the entire organization. And yet this is a new announcement that y'all have uh, announced about the, the Tower of Babel exhibit. No Babylon B. They're not building the Tower of Babel. Ha, ha, ha. We've all seen that story. Uh, it's an exhibit that will uh, explore this topic anew. Like, What, what can you tell us about what y'all have planned for the uh, Ark Encounter expansion? Yeah, so our plan is to build a tower. I mean, we don't know exactly what the original would have looked like, how big it would have been. I think people have um, all sorts of preconceived ideas that are probably false. Well, it's always uh, a ziggurat, it. for example. A lot of times people portray it that way. I mean, there's the old 1600 picture where it's this big circular tower that goes all the way up. Yeah, I kind of like that one, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Um, but if you think about it, the people living at that time, um, you know, you're within the first several generations after the flood, maybe just hundreds or thousands of people on the earth at that point, the biggest building you've ever seen is probably your tent or, a, you know, a little one story mud brick home, maybe two stories. Uh, if you saw the ark, then you saw something a little bigger than that. But other than that, they haven't seen anything real big. So what does it mean to build something whose top is in the heavens? Uh, that's the same wording that's used for the walls of Jericho. Um, if they built it 30 or 40 feet high, is that big enough? Um, and it probably would have been. Uh, it's the first of one of these type of towers after the flood. Um, so it's usually portrayed as a ziggurat, and that, I think that's the route we're going to be going with it. And ours will be taller than the 40-foot thing. It'll probably be between 80 and 90, something like that. We don't want it to be taller than the arc, you know, from a uh, just from our own themed attraction perspective. But what we want to do on the inside is, uh, we're still developing this storyline right now, but it, it'll probably be along the lines of a dark ride, you know, where you get into the, the, the car and it takes you around for, 10 to 15 minutes and it's telling you the the biblical account and it's also 
addressing the issues of racism you know from a biblical perspective we're all one blood we all go back to adam and eve we all go back to noah and his family um so there's no justification for racism from a biblical perspective um we're all made in god's image we all have the same problem which is sin and we all have the same solution and that's the gospel of jesus christ and so that yeah that's the message like you said Stephen. we've been proclaiming that as a ministry for for decades mm. and um it's but it, it's something that in our world today boy is it, is it ever needed more than any time in the last five or six decades I, um you know I, I remember growing up in the 80s and into the 90s and even early 2000s and in race relations so-called race relations were all one race the human race um it, they were getting better for the most part in our country but in the last 10 to 15 years for political reasons for other reasons there has been a lot of division and um, there are people who benefit from pushing that narrative. So yeah. I'm, my hopes is that what we develop in over the next few years here is the most powerful anti-racist gospel affirming message that anybody will ever encounter. That sounds fantastic. And two quick observations. First off, I, I must admit that uh, out of a preference to hear it from you, I did not read too deep into the news. And so I don't know whether this was already out there and I don't want to hold Ark Encounter to this. But when you mentioned it was going to be, you know, a, an active structure, I was thinking, put a dark ride in there. That would be so amazing. Oh. <laughs> and then you say dark ride and I go, wow, synergy. Uh, my second observation <laughs> is a challenge and, and, a, and a, skeptical, uh, a skeptical address to any atheistic or skeptical headline writers. One of y'all had better come up with the phrase for a headline called Race Mountain, or else I will be sore disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, that's funny. Maybe maybe that's what we'll nickname it when you know how a lot of films they give it a fake name when they all get t shirts. Oh, yes, yeah, so put it on maybe the clip. Put it on yeah, the that's board. what we yeah. <laughs> all of our construction guys need to be wearing stuff that say race mountain. <laughs> Hashtag race mountain. <laughs> that's great. Well, you know, we talked earlier about how the there's this unfortunate affiliation a lot of Christians have in their mind between artistic license and sort of deconstruction of faith. You know, we, we, we see these movies, we read these books and we're like, that is not what happened in the Bible. And you know, if, if you use your, if you use your imagination too much, I guess it takes you away from God's truth. And, and so we sort of develop this habit of, of seeing any imaginative storytelling as dangerous. What I would love to hear is how the artistic license, the artistic license that you guys have taken, how have you seen that construct people's faith or maybe even reconstruct people's faith? Can you think of a story where someone who's gone through the Ark Encounter has said, wow, you know, this really makes me want to go back to my Bible or get in my Bible more, or maybe I should consider reading the Bible now. Like how, how has that helped build or rebuild someone's faith? Yeah, let me... Uh... Uh, let me give an example of the the opposite first where like you were talking about where people really get upset about the the idea of artistic license um i remember when the risen movie came out about mm. four or five years ago which i really uh, i like I mean, resurrection is my favorite topic anyways but i really like that film oh, risen is so good it's yeah so good. and um i had i remember watching certain uh commentators who just like to rip on things all day long uh, just trashing that film and talking about how you know it shows peter as not knowing anything and that you know that he couldn't answer basic questions and and they, they really ripped on the apostles and it was like these are the guys who wrote scripture it's like yeah but they weren't at that point yeah <laughs> that everything was brand new to them their whole world had just been turned upside down twice within the span of like five days and they didn't have the holy and, spirit yet exactly and so i thought risen did such a great job of showing peter and John and others trying to figure it out. Like, what does this mean? What is it? What impact is this going to have on us going forward? And we don't think about it that way because we just think of them as authors of scripture. We think of them from 2000 years of history, looking back and what they became. Uh, we don't imagine what it was like for them in that time. And, and it was similar for me when I was writing the Noah series, the, the remnant trilogy, what could Noah know? And when could he know it? You know, is anything in Genesis one through six fair game that that he could have known those things, or is it just are those traditions that are passed on to him? And so he's got to decide: Do I believe these things or not? Because they're not inscripturated yet; they're just 
uh, it's just part of that history. And did, did some of that become mythology for him? Um, did his uh, great grandfather Enoch did he actually disappear? You know, did God really take him, or did something happen to him? Did he, did he did he run away? Did he? You know, Noah has to decide: Do I believe these things? So that was fun to to try to put yourself in his sandals, if you will, and figure out what it would have been like for him at that time, um, not having all of scripture there for you. And what, what could you know about the creator? I often think that he knew more than what we can know that he knew, but probably knew a lot less than what most Christians assume. Mm. Because I think most of us just assume, well, he had everything. I said, no, what? Uh, scripture is progressively revealed. And so the, the gospel message wasn't there yet. Christ hadn't died yet. Um, so then going, taking that and going back to what you had asked about uh, uh, examples at the Ark Encounter. Yeah, we've had uh, people who have shared their testimony that um, of, of giving their life to the Lord while they were going through the Ark, which, of course, Fantastic. you get one of those and it makes it all worthwhile. And yeah. uh, we've had multiple. Um, and some of it is because it, for the first time, it, it feels real to them. And even though, and that's what Stephen was talking about, it's immersive and you're, you're in this ark and it's the same size or roughly the same size as what Noah's would have been. Obviously it's laid out differently because it's a themed attraction. We've got exhibits everywhere, which I don't think Noah had exhibits everywhere, but it is really interesting that God can use that to start softening that person's heart. And so when they encounter the gospel, it, it makes sense that those roadblocks or stumbling blocks have been removed through uh whether it's the apologetic arguments or whether whether it's just the historical or scientific details that we've gone through in the arc and um that's yeah, it really is a unique privilege it's a it's a unique place at both the creation museum and the ark encounter um i think Stephen, you talked about it earlier about the excellence at which things are done and that's what i would always tell people like look it's a lot bigger than you expect and it's a lot higher quality than you expect because we're used to most Christian things being done at a lower level, you know, and it shouldn't be that way. Whether it's our storytelling with our novels, they should be well-written. Whether it's our movies, they should be well done. Even if you don't have the, the big budget, you can still produce a good story, get the best quality actors that you can afford. Amen. Yeah. And it's, there's going to be drawback. I mean, it's not going to line up with, what Disney can do from a storytelling perspective, because they can, even though a lot of times they put up some, some of their stories aren't great, but, but they have the budget to have two or three years worth of meetings with the top sc screenwriters in the world. And they can develop just about anything they want to, and they can make it look great. So we're going to be at a disadvantage when you have $2 million for a full length feature, but you should still be striving to do, to give the Lord your best. And, that's always been our position at Answers in Genesis at the Ark Encounter of the Museum is make everything top quality so that even the, the critics, they can't say that it isn't well done. Um, when I led the atheists through the Ark that opening day, I asked some of them what they thought. And they said, you know, it's a beautiful structure. And one thing that they came away from that event, because there were several of us that were down there talking to them, I think what impressed upon them is that these are people who really believe this. Mm -hmm. I think prior to that, a lot of them thought, oh, they're just in it for the money. Which mm. I, I'm not sure if they understand people in ministry usually don't make as much as people outside right. of ministry. <laughs> but I think because I see TV preachers and other things where it, yeah, it looks like they're in it for the money. Some of them obviously look like they're in it for the money. They're always talking about it. And they just associate every Christian with that. And no, that's not why we do it. It's, because we have a love for the Lord and he's called us to do it. And the artists that I work with are, they're just extraordinarily talented and I'm always amazed at what they can do. I can't draw a stick figure. At least not a very good one. And <laughs> they're just, uh, yeah, it's extraordinary. Well, beauty and creative expression are also unapologetic. Like I, I've seen young Christians in particular, uh, maybe those from more conservative backgrounds, you know, maybe they even grew up. I mean, by now you now have a whole generation that has grown up with at least some familiarity with apologetics. And I see some of them swerving aside and saying, well, well, that didn't help. Like that didn't answer my question. You know, how could a good God allow suffering? Which, by the way, whenever somebody asks that question, no doubt they have already read the answer somewhere. Uh, Zach and I had an episode early last year about a, a couple of uh, Christian, at least formerly Christian, they would call themselves uh, comedians who said, you know, been there, done that with the whole apologetics thing. 
Uh, I met a lot of a lot of nice gay people. You know, it's all about just love, and I'm not a Christian anymore. Well, you guys probably already read those arguments, uh, but you did not obviously imagine them. You did not bring them down to the heart level. Uh, what did you imagine instead, and how did that imagination draw other sinful impulses that were lingering in your heart, like a craving for celebrity or wealth or influence? Who knows? Beauty, however, is just as much an apologetic as the arguments uh, about uh, the, you know, the, the theodicy. How could a good God allow suffering? Or as Lex Luthor put it, if God is all-powerful, he cannot be all good. I love that moment, by the way. Uh, that's, that's the sort of thing that turns you into a villain and makes you try to kill a superhero. You need beauty and truth for these sorts of things. And I think young Christians ought not swing wild from one to the other. Like, well, we don't need the apologetics. We don't need the truth. Uh, we don't need the doctrine or the dogma. All we need is to make more beautiful things, and then the world will sit up and take notice. Uh, that's not always true. Uh, I think God has made us as fully human beings. We have minds as well as hearts. He has given us rational thought as well as fantastic imaginations. We use both first as acts of worship to glorify him, and then second to help one another draw close to him. Like I, I could see, like imagine a world, I mean, obviously we wouldn't be building an ark if there was a sinless world, but if Adam and Eve had never sinned, would we build gigantic, artistically excellent things like this purely as acts of worship to God? I believe we would, and I believe we will after King Jesus judges the world by fire, not water next time, and makes all things new. We're going to be making those beautiful things, and those beautiful things just by virtue of their beauty will shine God's glory back to him. Uh, it's a happy bonus that we still get to do that now and then help people see the beauty of God, uh, help people start to think about these things and have their imaginations shaped by God's word. Uh, and the immersion of Ark Encounter, like that's just, that's an experience I'd urge anybody who can to to get over there, take a tour of the boat, uh, and then eventually uh, take a ride or look at the exhibit or whatever y'all have planned for uh, for the Tower of Babel exhibit. And uh, uh, Tim, I meant to ask also, uh, there's also a new auditorium out there and there's some other uh, enhancements going on uh, at the Ark Encounter. I mean, it's going to be a full-fledged theme park before too long. Yeah, we've got a virtual reality experience called uh, Truth Traveler. And, um, you know, it's like an 11-minute ride where you sit in the chair and put the headsets on. We're expanding the size of the zoo uh, regularly. That's already twice as big as what it was when we first opened. We've got the Answer Center, which is a 2,500-seat auditorium. And uh, right now, they've got what they call 40 days and 40 nights of uh, music at the Ark. So we've got a bunch of... Um, Southern gospel groups who are coming in every single day. I think two groups and then a usually a well-known speaker who are going to be there every day. And uh, that runs through September 10th. Um, so there's a lot going on at the Ark. And yeah, the plan eventually is to build um, this Babel attraction. And we also want to continue on beyond that and really walk people through the entire Old Testament up until uh, the really until the time of Jesus and create like a first century village and uh, really walk people through biblical history from beginning to the end that's kind of our goal uh down at the ark property and then of course the creation museum's at a different site about 40 minutes away and uh, that focuses that, that's a little more um focused just on creation through the flood but but it still takes you through scripture as well and, and shares the gospel yeah it, it sounds like aig is creating the christian disney world there and i i just i love it because I love how you said that when people go through these, the Ark Encounter, it helps them feel the reality of the story of Genesis. That they realize, oh, this isn't just a myth, like you said. This is something real that actually happened in history. And now I can sort of, you know, wrap my five senses around it. And it's not just something I hear about or, or read about, but it's something I can see in, with my own eyes. And I, I just, I, again, I love that, that you are helping reconstruct or even construct people's faith in the word and that you're pointing them towards God. And uh, yeah, just way to go with all, all you guys are doing. Thanks. Yeah. It's, I think we talked earlier in some of your episodes, you've talked about it, just how fiction, how storytelling can be such a powerful mode or means of, of communicating truth. Um, and a lot of times when people try to justify that, they point to the parables in scripture and, and to some degree that works if we're doing it a little more directly in terms of, you know, parables, usually we're just like a, there's one main point you're supposed to get from this. And, um, but he was telling a story in order to help it stick. And there's some people who respond really well to that. You know, I've, I've received a lot of 
responses from young people to the Truth Chronicle series. They may not be willing to pick up a, you know, a, a nonfiction book that might be 300 pages or 500 pages of apologetics, but they might be willing to do a time travel adventure with dinosaurs and explosions and all that, where they're learning oh, what it means to up. A, yes. yeah, what it means yes. to have a biblical worldview and how to defend the faith and a lot of those arguments, how can Noah fit the animals on the ark? All those things are woven through the storyline, not in a preachy way, but in just the way that the story is set up, it, it comes up. And um, so that's been a really fun way to present the truth. And um, I, I'm just, I'm thrilled to be a part of it and to, to be able to continue to do this at the ark and everything else that we're doing, uh, upgrading the museum and whatever is coming next at the Ark property with the, with Babel and some of the other things we have planned. It's, um, it's exciting to be here at this time and to, to work with the people I work with. I, I just, I, I can't say enough good things about the, the artists and the fabricators and what they do. If, if people have been through the creation museum anytime in the last, um, 11 months now, since we opened the fearfully, wonderfully made exhibit, the baby models that we put in there, that our team made those things from scratch and they are so realistic looking. That people have asked, you know, did you use real babies? It's like, no, oh. <laughs> they're not real babies. They, they made these things from silicone or from some whatever else. What about the body worlds exhibit? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, I don't. It's just, I'm always amazed at what they can do. I don't know if it's just because I'm so untalented when it comes to art. I, mean, I can't. <laughs> I am left brained and almost completely left brain. I have just a little bit of right brain with the creativity as far as storytelling, but other than that. No musical ability, no artistic ability. <laughs> um, God didn't give me any of those things, but man, he sure did. To the people that I work with, he sure gave them that. Well, we shall assemble an Ark Encounter sized collection of links in the show notes for this episode. So make sure you go to lorehaven.com slash podcast and look at the page for episode 74. Tim, where can people track your progress as you're going about uh, speaking and helping create and all of that? Uh, at Answers in Genesis or ArkEncounter.com or uh, any other links where folks can follow you? Uh, yeah, they'll be able to see at those two that you, you mentioned. There's also CreationMuseum.com. But uh, for my own personal site, it's RisenMin.com, which is short for Risen Ministries. So RisenMin.com. Uh, that'll tell you about some of the things that I've been working on um, outside of work and uh, some of my own uh, writing ministry and speaking ministry. The other place would be my author page on Facebook. Uh, I think it's just facebook.com slash Tim Chafee author, I think is what it is. Um, I'll update that pretty regularly. Well, you'll find a flood of resources at all of those links, uh, not only about the head level apologetics, but the heart level imagination, which is where we want to live here at Fantastical Truth and Lorehaven. Tim, Godspeed to you. Thank you so much for what you do. Uh, hope we'll have you back uh, the next time there is a Tower of Babel to ride. Hey, that sounds fantastic. Hey, guys, thanks so much for having me on. It's been a lot of fun, and keep up the great work. Thanks, Tim. Stephen, that was such a fun conversation with Tim. I, I loved everything he said about the uh, artistic license and how, you know, once they gave that disclaimer, it, it sort of took away the um, the pressure people were feeling of, like, examining everything to see if it was you know, faithful to scriptures, since a lot of what they're imagining is not covered by scriptures. And it's not, it's not like we're adding stuff to the Bible. We are just imagining what else could happen. We're just imagining it out loud, like all good fiction. And I love when he was talking about the flood, it's like, why was there a flood? Which is really what, that's the core question everyone wonders with this story. And I love that answer that, well, it gave people a chance to repent. And it, that's exactly right. We we look at these judgments of God and we think, wow, that's so harsh. Uh, you know that that's that's not very modern or um, <laughs> that's not very tolerant. But you think about the love that was behind that, and and even just the the point that God is preserving humanity and trying to save humanity, even though He's obviously wiping out all life on the earth. If you don't see God's love behind that, you're you're not looking very carefully. And I love how everything that they've built there is pointing people to the scriptures and really showing people a fuller picture of God. Amen. Uh, you probably heard this in that conversation, but I can be counted, I think, as an Answers in Genesis stan. 
And I'm loving this <laughs> next uh, generation of uh, Answers in Genesis. I mean, this one has an actual arc encounter as they'd hoped to do in the early days. You know, in the first stage, it was basically, you know, Ken Ham and some other speakers going around doing seminars uh, and then signing people up for their newsletter. That's the first stage, you know, and then cassettes in the little plastic uh, book. And then the second stage, they have a website. They're fundraising for the Creation Museum. Stage three, you have a Creation Museum and they're talking about Ark Encounter. Uh, stage four, uh, they are bigger than ever. I think rightfully so. I would say that any of the seminars and stuff, like that's all going on in the background and any of the apologetics at answersingenesis.org, that's the support. Uh, the real emphasis seems to be these attractions, which are helping people not only to think about these issues, but to see them, to touch them. Uh, I mentioned that beauty is an apologetic. It's not the only one, just like, you know, truth apologetics, the arguments and the logical stuff. And that's not our only proof for mm -hmm. God. We, we go out there and we make cool stuff to show what God is like, you know, not just, wow, here's an ark, you know, it's architecturally solid and here's some great exhibits in there to make you think about how this could have happened. But also there's this beautiful garden outside the creation museum. One of my favorite features of that attraction, just going out there amongst the beauty of God, which God in his grace allows to continue even in a world that groans under sin. And there's the little butterflies and the insects, and you can go over there and take a look at a camel. And all of that, I think, uh, magnifies God the creator just as much, if not more so, uh, than, the, than the apologetics you find in the museum. So you get God's handiwork out there seen as well as thought about. And then you go in the museum and there's an animatronic dinosaur. Uh, which is awesome. That's always and, awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, anima, who, who's going to say no to animatronic dinosaurs? <laughs> uh, and it's just, it's a fantastic place to visit. And I, I appreciate that emphasis on biblical faithfulness, but also uh, experimenting a bit with the imagination. Like we've talked about biblical fiction on the podcast before, uh, kind of an adjunct genre to fantastical fiction with a lot of the same rules. Like any of the speculation has to be based on scripture. And I think that will actually help set our imaginations free. We have more liberty when we are following the Bible rather than trying to break outside of it. And then as a happy bonus, you get to start thinking through some of the answers to those questions. Where did Cain get his wife? That's what Ken Ham, I never even thought about that question until Ken Ham started answering. Where did Cain get his wife? And then you go through and you talk about, you know, how the genetics work and what may have happened after the curse and how the you know DNA decay started then. And then, oh, there's there's actually a pretty good, solid Christian answer to that, as well as like issues that I used to think about the flood. Like, wait a minute, was every single person on Earth really that evil deserving of a flood? And then I read a, um, a biblical fiction series, a fantasy series, actually by a, an author whose pen name was Douglas Hurt. Uh, this was really fantastical. I mean, it was basically pre-flood Middle Earth, and now there are so many of those series, but that's, that's, that's a really good one. And then by the end, there's spaceships, and then God is also destroying uh, the, the fifth planet between uh, Mars and Jupiter, which is where you get the asteroid belt, by the oh, way. Okay. Spaceships. I mean, there's a spaceship on the cover of book three, but book three, which takes place right up to and uh, leading to the flood, uh, you get the idea that all the evil people on earth are going out and killing any of the other righteous who are left, who would have gone on the ark. Mm -hmm. And right as the rain begins to pour, like the last good guys are defending the land in which the ark is being built. And wow. they fall in battle, spoiler alert, as the heavens open uh, and God begins to judge the earth. So God, his righteousness is vindicated. The biblical narrative is not contradicted in that story. And that just opens up all kinds of possibilities for Christians to conform the stories that we enjoy to God's word. You know, there, there's almost something to how a lot of prequel movies are being made now where it's like, you already know how the story is going to end. And so in a sense, what happens in the prequel doesn't really change anything. It just sort of shows you how things could have gotten to that point. And what I'm thinking of is uh, Rogue One you know, it, it's sort of episode 3.9, basically, in the Star Wars saga. And, you know, you already know what's going to happen. They're going to get the Death Star plans, and then eventually they're going to destroy the Death Star. But you don't, you know, you wonder, how did they get those plans, and what what happened to those people? It, it's probably one of my favorite Star Wars movies now. Um, I, I re-watch re it every now and then, because I I want to know more of the backstory. And I think that's what they've done such a good job of with the Ark Encounter is they've created the backstory, the possible backstory, the imaginative backstory. 
of this world, of Noah's family. Uh, you know, and I love that they even gave all of the, um, the other characters on the boat names. Uh, you know, and why not? You know, we're, again, we're just imagining. We're, we're not saying, oh, this is how it was. Thus saith the Lord. And this should be in a new translation of the Bible. It's we, we are picturing in our mind who these people were. And hey, spoiler alert, we are going to get to meet these people in heaven one day. And that that's an amazing thing. And we're going to get to hear the real story from them, which again, our faith is built on truth. It's built on reality. It's built on things that actually happen in history and things that will happen in the future. And uh, man, I, I really do hope we get dinosaurs, Stephen, in the new earth. That'd be awesome. I'm convinced we'll get dinosaurs. And thanks to Answers in Genesis, I even thought to ask the question. Uh, they planted so many seeds of biblically derived imagination uh, in my head and in my heart. Uh, it's very likely that apart from their work, uh, you and I would not be talking now, Zach. So I'm really looking forward to taking a ride on a Triceratops. As silly as it sounds to some people, why not? Uh, this is not contradicted by God's word and is actively encouraged, I think, by God's word for us to look forward to the restoration of creation bigger and better than it was in the Garden of Eden and bigger and better than our imaginations of it can be now. So what are you looking forward to in the restored creation? And what do you think about this whole human origins debate? I'm sure lots of our listeners have heard many ideas about that from Answers in Genesis and others. And of course, what do you think about the uh, the fantastic imagination of the pre-flood world or the flood itself? Do reach out to us. You can email podcast at lorehaven.com or go to our show notes for this episode, lorehaven.com slash podcast for episode 74. You can find the feedback form there. You can also contact us on the socials. Search Facebook for Lorehaven Mag. That's the same name on Instagram, Lorehaven Mag. Then on Twitter, just look for at Lorehaven. Give us a tag. Share us your thoughts. Next on Fantastical Truth, what if your father died and made you the emperor? But along with your normal emperor responsibilities, you also had to keep control of the sun. Then you learned the sun was fading and the gods might oppose your new marriage. That's the story of Lonnie Forbes' Mesoamerican flavor fantasy, The Seventh Sun, last seen winning several 2021 Realm Awards at the Realm Makers Conference. And next week, Lonnie will rejoin Fantastical Truth to share this story. Meanwhile, whatever you think about Genesis or Noah's flood or any of the fantastic events that may have surrounded this flood, make sure you conform every imagination, every belief to the word of God with respect for its divine author, Jesus Christ, as we continue to seek and find his fantastical truth. <laughs>